We're very honored to have for our seminar, for our EOL seminar speaker this uh, month, Vanda Grubashik. Sheik, got it. <clears throat> uh, she has a long history with NCAR, starting from when she was a grad student still at Yale. She uh, participated in the NCAR Hawaiian Rain Bands project. And after she graduated from Yale with her doctorate, she uh, took an ASP postdoc position. After that, she went to the Desert Research Institute in Nevada. There, she investigated the physical processes of gravity wave interaction, formation and stability of mountain waves, evolution of Hawaiian rain bands, momentum transport by clouds, and quantitative uh, precipitation forecasting. While there, she again had more projects with, involved with NCAR, the mesoscale, mesoscale uh, alpine program, and she was also involved or led the 2006 T-Rex experiment, which was among the first ones to use the new NSF NCAR G5 aircraft. While also at DRI, she received the 2003 Wagner Young Scientist Award, and she was a lead scientist in the University uh, of Nevada's Advanced Computing and Environmental Sciences Program, a $3.5 million NSF-funded program linking computational scientists and research facilities. <clears throat> she then became a professor at the University of Vienna, and we finally tapped her to become the director of the uh, EOL in 2011. And lastly, in 2013, she became a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. So if you could, please welcome Wanda. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much um, for that very accurate introduction and even an attempt to pronounce my last name. So Stuart, much appreciated. It's a pleasure to be in this uh, auditorium and stand on this stage in a very different capacity. So this is not an EOL town hall. This is an EOL seminar. Uh, really, truly my pleasure to present to you the research uh, that we have been carrying on, I have been working on for quite, quite some time now, um, on wave-induced boundary layer separation not in the T-Rex area, but in the Lee of Medicine Bow Mountains. And soon I will describe where these mountains are. Um, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of my collaborators on this, Stefano Serafin and Lucas Strauss from the University of Vienna. Also, Sam Haimov and Jeff French um, from the University of Wyoming. An outline of the talk, I'd like, I'll start with a proper introduction to the subjects to introduce many of you who know a bit less than I do about wave-induced boundary layer separation. Tell a few things about the field experiment itself, the observations. Presenting to you the observations um, will be a major portion of this talk, and these observations represent the first uh, as, as to the best of our knowledge, the first direct documentation of wave-induced boundary la layer separation in the atmosphere. I'll present some numerical simulation results to go into the summary and the outlook of the stock and also outlook of my future work. The last century, half century of atmospheric research can be characterized by the leapfrogging between observations, theory, and simulations, and those simulations could be numerical simulations or could be experimental, um, ex ex num uh, laboratory experiments. They have gone some, somewhat out of vogue, but they are still there. Um, there were quite, quite a few of them back in the 1950s, but people are still doing laboratory experiments, and I might be one of those. Well, actually, I am one of those. The leapfrogging between observations, simulations, and theory has allowed us to make great strides and advances in, in research in atmospheric and related sciences. And that, in the last two decades or so, has actually become even faster and easier. And that characterizes my own research, is the interplay between observations, uh, which still are a pinnacle of geophysical research. Um, they, they will never go out of vogue. Um, and then the simulations and theory. Things are coming closer together, in part because of the technologies. Things are faster. We get faster the data from the field campaigns. We also have numerical models in these field campaigns. And the theory is there to link things together. And my own research has resided at various times at the interfaces between the circles. It could be observations and theory, observations and simulations or actually can be in this central region, um, the three coming together. 
bit on boundary layer separation. An important problem, a difficult problem. Certainly, it's difficult for theoretical dealings. For direct numerical simulations, it, it is very hard to do them um, because there is a reverse flow uh, and flow in one direction and the opposite direction at the same time. And most of the insight, um, uh, quite a bit of insight, actually comes from the laboratory experiments. So the problem that dates back to the beginning of the 20th century with some early work by Prandtl, much has been done. It has implications in the atmospheric sciences, but it has applications also in, in the aerodynamic engineering, um, very important for aircraft to have that, um, the minimum um, of, of that wake in the, in the uh, lee of the, of the airfoil. Separation itself is characterized by the peeling off the frictional boundary layer from the surface, so from the solid wall. Um, at the solid wall, the velocity has to be zero. Um, outside of it is non-zero. There is a strong shear. There is strong vorticity. And under certain conditions, that uh, shear layer separates from the solid obstacle and becomes airborne, becomes free. Um, you can see the separation of a laminar boundary layer here. Um, and it retains its identity and lam laminar nature for a while, and it becomes dynamically unstable and breaks down, and there is a wake. There are wakes in both cases. The cases to the right represents actually the separation of a turbulent boundary layer, and as you can see, the wake is somewhat smaller. So that external, um, the, this element of the deceleration of the external flow, sudden, rapid, and strong enough, um, is a key to boundary layer separation occurring. That deceleration can be wave-induced. What I showed you in the previous slide was the neutral flow, so no stratification. In the continuously stratified fluid, such as the atmosphere, that external pressure gradient can be that deceleration can be induced by mountain waves. And again, much of our insight into when does the separation occur come from the laboratory experiments. These are laboratory experiments by Baines and Hoinka. They are summarized in, in Baines, a very nice summary provided there. In general, uh, uh, what you, we have to keep in mind, this is two-dimensional two flow, so exactly two-dimensional flow, um, the um, infinite ridge, and the flow um, is going over that, over that ridge. Two parameters, non-dimensional non parameters, are important to characterize this flow. One is the steepness of a lee side on the lee side of the obstacle, steepness increasing this way, and the other one is the non-linearity of the flow, telling us when the flow uh, is small amplitude, we can expect it to be small amplitude here, progressively becoming more nonlinear. But in this direction also, the stability is increasing, and that leads to the generation of waves, and wave, possible wave induced separation. Three regimes you can see here, no separation, boundary layer following the obstacle, Lee side bluff body boundary layer separation, you can think of it as a separation from the steepest, from, from the top of the obstacle, and this is the wave-induced separation. This is the par portion of the, the parameter regime that is of interest to me in this research and has been in to interest in, to us, but this is something that is well known also from the laboratory experiments, and it does happen at any salient point that there might be in the flow, no stability, zero Brunt-Weiss cell frequency, and the steepness of the obstacle increasing this way. So much what we know about uh, wave-induced boundary layer separation has come from idealized numerical experiments, most of them 2D, some of them 3D, all looking for steady state solutions um, to, to the governing equations. Um, and the problem that consists of a flow of a two-dimensional obstacle, and, or three-dimensional obstacle in this case. There is stratification, waves form. These waves can take various shapes and forms. But in particular, nice one for inducing um, these pressure perturbations and having them in the right place are trapped Lie waves. The flow is from right to left. The boundary layer separates at this point. The boundary layer shear zone becomes free-born. 
And then um, there is a phenomenon here on the lee side, which is called an atmospheric rotor. And you can think of it as a big horizontal vortex parallel to the mountain uh, that has a rather complex internal structure. It's not so simple. Um, and it poses a great hazard to general aviation in complex terrain, very turbulent, very, very dangerous. The laboratory experiments, in addition to Baines that I already mentioned, there are some newer experiments actually trying attempting to, that had attempted to reproduce some of the results of the numerical simulations. And the flip image from left flow from left to right, you see that wave and that turbulent rotor underneath. Here in this talk, I will be talking about field explorations. And the major field exploration that Stuart mentioned was the terrain-induced rotor experiment in Owens Valley in Southern California in 2006 a large international field campaign uh, with a significant uh, round-based instrumentation deployment as well. Very successful, we documented waves, mountain waves, we documented the rotor internal structure, we documented the structure of the waves at high levels. Just for the record, that was the first official deployment of the G5, not among the first, but the first official deployment. Um, but I won't be talking about T-Rex. I, in, in here. I will be talking about another field campaign, a smaller field campaign that goes under name NASA 06. It took place in southeastern Wyoming. It was an orographic cloud and precipitation experiment, not a mountain wave experiment, and this shows the value of using the, full, the field data to the fullest um, to, to exploit all the data that was collected uh, for other research, not just only the one that, that has been planned. The target area, again, southeastern Wyoming, the, a few pieces of the terrain that are important here, the Medicine Bow Mountain, the Sierra Madre um, to the east, Laramie Mountains, sorry, Laramie Mountains to the east, Sierra Madre to the west. These do not represent, play, they do not play much of a role in this problem because the flow is mostly uh, from the northwest direction. Two smaller obstacles, Elk Mountain and Sheep Mountain. And I'm pointing your attention to the location of the wind profiler that we have data from, from which we have used the data. Taking the parameters of this terrain and the typical stability, wind speeds, um, the following values of the steepness and the nonlinearity parameter arise. So we have 10% slopes uh, for the Medicine Bow range and the nonlinearity parameter somewhere from 1 to 1.8. If we go back to the two-dimensional diagram, that places Medicine Bow Mountains into a slightly weakly nonlinear regime, or fully nonlinear regime at this point. Um, and it's somewhere here beyond that line that delineates no separation from wave-induced boundary separation. Thus, Mountain waves of various strengths and amplitudes can be expected, some of them strong and nonlinear, and wave induced boundary separation should not be a surprise in this terrain. Again, this was an orographic clouds and precipitation experiment, and as such, the main platform was airborne, and that main platform was the Wyoming King Air, um, instrumented uh, with in situ sensors as, as, as well as cloud probe. In cloud probes are in situ, but other in situ instrumentation. The centerpiece of instrumentation here is the Wyoming cloud radar, 95 gigahertz radar. Um, the ideal scatterers are cloud particles, cloud drops, cloud ice. This is January and February in Wyoming, so the scatterers are ice. It's, it's ice, cloud ice. Uh, and the various uh, configurations of these radar beams are possible for this radar. We use the up, down, and forward down B, the angle between down and forward down is approximately 30, 30 degrees. In the vertical plane, by spanned by these two beams, one can do the dual Doppler analysis of the wind data, and the resolution of that is 30 by 30 meters. Seven flights were flown in this field campaign, and we selected two events. Um, for the basic criterion was the strength of the vertical updrafts encountered along the flight legs, and also some of the early uh, views into the uh, radar, radar analysis, radar backscatter, etc. 26 January and 5th February are the two events. The basic flight pattern consisted in uh, cross-mountain passes. 
There were five of those in the 26th of January case, two flown at 4,300 meters and three flown at 5,200 meters. So this is some 1,100 to 1,700 meters above the highest point of the terrain. And um, in the 5th February case, there were four passes um, and 5,200, again, the similar, similar altitudes. You will note that the orientation of this cross mountain um, flight tracks is different. They were aligned with the predominant wind direction at the flight level. This one, in terms of the terrain, gives one major obstacle, and this is Medicine Bow, Medicine Bow Peak. And with, on the 5th of February, we have three obstacles Elk Mountain, Medicine Bow, and Sheep Mountain. And that will actually, we'll see that plays quite a bit of role. The synoptic environment for these two events is somewhat similar, and if I were to use one sentence to characterize them, I would say they were um, associated with a passage with a uh, frontal trough. However, on that, there was a shortwave signature, and that one actually provided the boost that led to um, wave-induced boundary layer separation. The data from the Medicine Bow wind profiler, time is increasing from left to right, and the, at the bottom is the uh, two aircraft soundings. Um, one was a ramp sounding that was done. Let me go back to show you. So one was the ramp sounding that started somewhere on the lee side of the mountain and the uh, missed approach, um, eventually a missed approach to the Saratoga Airport, which is right here. And then the spiral sounding up. Um, for the other case, it was the spiral sounding um, to the north. So if we look at the wind profile data, we can see um, the passage of that short wave, a strong pulse of the momentum near the ground, decrease of wind with height. And if we look when the research flight took place, it took place after that feature. So we can um, still, there's a stronger pulse of momentum near the ground and the weakening of the winds. But soon after that, there is a transition to mostly northwesterly wind. Um, that actually increases, um, that decreases, decreases with height. That is reflected in the aircraft sounding well. And again, disregard this upper portion because that is not representative of the upstream environment, rather of the lee side of the obstacle. So we see the wind speed of 18 to 14 to 18 meters per second, decrease linearly sheared profile, continuously stratified more or less. There are some minor um, layers of increased strength, of in, uh, sorry, the uh, not inversion, but the stability, which you can see actually in the Brunt-Vicella profile here. But overall, it looks like a more or less uniform stability and a strong, rather strong wind, especially at low levels. The 5th February, again, similar, but in this case, um, although the orientation of that um, trough is somewhat different, and the observations um, were taken during um, immediately um, after the surface signature of this short trough uh, passed, but the still there was quite a bit of uh, decrease and turning of wind at height. So you see there where the time of, the, of these soundings is. Um, Again, we see the pulse of momentum and more or less the uniform wind, wind height. There's some indication at the very top that the wind increases, uh, which could promote decreases, which could promote wave energy trapping at low levels. Let me move on to the cloud radar observations. I'll start with the 26th of January. Two legs of those five, I selected two, leg three and leg five. Um, that were flown um, at different altitudes, and um, actually they were flown at the same altitude. Uh, you can see the altitude, it's an orange, orange line, no, there. Um, and the upward pointing beam and the downward pointing beam of the radar are combined, giving the information about the vertical velocity in this cross section. This is the peak of the Medicine Bow Mountains upwind and downwind of the Medicine Bow over the Laramie Valley. What we see here is a slope of the cloud on the lee side. So it's a downslope flow that plunges down and the cloud thins, evaporates. Uh, there is a very strong 
not so much in the radar data, but from the in-situ data I will show you, there is quite a bit of excitement, very strong updraft and, and a strong downdraft of this. There is some indication of that in the radar image as well. 50, oh, sorry, 30 minutes or so later, 35 minutes later, um, the, there is a better, actually, distribution of scatters. That thinning is a little bit less. There is a strong down. And then this feature that looks related to that is found further upwind. Um, we can clearly see the strong updraft and a strong downdraft. Now, combining this with the flight level data, and so here we have, um, again, it, it is this, now it's in terms of a distance, a long drag distance. This is the height of the mountain, Medicine Bow Mountains. This is the terrain profile. Horizontal wind speed and combined with it is the turbulence analysis, turbulence um, value coming from the McCready meter on board the aircraft. Um, this one is shown in dashed. In the upper panel, you see vertical component of the wind in solid and the potential temperature in dashed. The same is shown for, for the other leg. And there are several features that are worth attention here. A strong ramp up of potential temperature, a strong jump in the turbulence measure right behind the peak, then almost zero horizontal velocity and variation, uh, quite a bit of variability in turbulence. No, almost no vertical velocity there. And then the third segment is the location of that strong updraft, downdraft couplet that I showed you in, in the radar data. This is at the flight level. The updraft note is plus 12 meters per second, and the downdraft is minus 7 meters per second. The aircraft flew right through it. Just to, ahead of this updraft, there's a very strong um, uh, turbulence that drops down, then it recovers again. Were you on the plane? I was not on this plane, but I was on the plane, as you know, in T-Rex, on many of the flights where, by design, we went through similar features. Although I will try to persuade you that this is actually gravity wave breaking. This is not a rotor, but flying down here uh, would have been even more dangerous. So 35 minutes later, we see that updraft downdraft couplet. It is much tamer at this time, plus, five, plus minus 5 meters per second. There is turbulence, and there is a jump in the horizontal wind speed. So the low, again, this feature of high turbulence, low horizontal wind speed, at, at the leading edge of the, of the vertical velocity coupling. The data signal to noise ratio <laughs> for this flight leg was not good enough to do do dual Doppler analysis, but the dual Doppler analysis was done on this other one, and you can see a very strong downslope flow exceeding 35 meters per second and a very rapid updraft and sudden disorganized flow, weak and disorganized flow um, behind this leading edge. Again, this radar has tremendous resolution. And so I can show you this in a little bit more detail. So I take the same leg five. This is the length of the flight track. Blue, um, green actually is zero, so that is an outline of the ground. The peak of the Medicine Bow Mountains, a very strong plunging downslope flow, rapid adjustment, and the streamline analysis, assuming steady state, over the, over the length of, of this flight leg, uh, we can recover streamlines, and you see an updraft, and then the curling feature. And perhaps it is better to look that in further more detail, and you, you see this. Now we can see, actually resolve some of the, see some of the eddies here underneath, underneath this separated uh, boundary layer. So this looks like a definite um, definite documentation of a boundary layer separation where the boundary layer vortex sheet is separated from the ground, gets airborne, becomes unstable, and as we've learned in T-Rex and research, uh, this is too most likely shear instability along that separated, along that separated uh, boundary layer vortex sheet. Is there a cloud here? <laughs> Actually, there's a cloud everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere where you see where there's reflectivity here, 
this is actually the cloud. And that uh, this is one of the reasons that prompted us to go to Southeast Wyoming. Um, we were looking for coverage, cloud coverage, all the way to the ground, so you, we could take the advantage of, the, of what this radar has to offer. Uh, we did great things in T-Rex, but one of the things that we came short is actually documentation of the boundary layer separation process due to the lack of scatterers in the right place, whether that be our aerosol or cloud particles on the, on the lee side. But that, that tribute region could have been larger than what you have there because there weren't scatterers or radar to see it, I guess. In this case, the, the cloud goes all the way to the ground. So yeah. the, yeah, to the north, I'll show some of the three-dimensional uh, three elements of, of this flow when we get to the numerical modeling. 5th February uh, cloud radar observation. So again, looking at the vertical velocity from the two radar beams. Um, in this case, it's not orange, but it's white strip. This is the flight leg, um, the times, approximate times of this legs, and what we also marked is the position of the crest of the wave. But let me backtrack. The, the peak of the Medicine Bow Mountain is here. This fourth leg actually was flown further south. We see a downdraft, an updraft, and downdraft, and some disorganized flow. We, and where we put this vertical line is right at the transition between red and blue, marking the position of the crest of the wave. We see that that one moves upward, that moves um, upwind. The speed of that movement is approximately six kilometers per hour, whereas in the 26th of January case, it was 12 kilometers per hour. So in both cases, we, we, the, we see the upwind shift of that boundary layer separation point. This is clearly seen in the, in the dual Doppler analysis, and I will jump to the bottom. So this is the first leg, and this is the third leg of that flight. Again, we see the plunging downslope flow, a much more organized flow than it was in the 26th January case, less steep. Nevertheless, underneath this, there is quite a bit what appears to be small scales. Again, the separated boundary layer separation. Um, a separated boundary layer um, vortex uh, sheet. In this case, the downslope flow is weaker, and the wave perhaps more regular, and even indication of another way for, for the downwind. The location, you can see in here that up, upstream movement of that point. In terms of the flight level data, um, there is some indication that something exciting is happening at 5.2 kilometers right, and this on the lee side of the obstacle. Again, similar signatures as we saw in the 26th of January. Um, the, uh, the horizontal wind speed goes down, turbulence goes up, the spike in the potential temperature, and the strong vertical velocities. The downwind feature is there, but is not as weak, and later, 50 minutes, 50 minutes later, we, we get uh, some, some only a little bit of uh, variability of, of turbulence, but nothing much and nothing. So the wave, it seems like the wave has become smoother and the flow better organized. So let me provide another view and then try to summarize all these different features that, that um, I have pointed your attention to. The upper panel is a, again, vertical velocity field from leg five from the 26th of January. Um, you see the aircraft in situ aircraft data now combined with the remotely sensed data. The updraft along the flight track is at the right place, and so is the downdraft. There is turbulence at that level, as one can see in the um, variability of the vertical velocity. That turbulence is at the moderate level but where the excitement really lies is down at the lower levels, and this is the, the same parameter that we um, typically derive from the in-situ aircraft data, the technique applied and it's, um, it, to the remote sensing data with much care, and you see the data, the, um, 
Sigma W only there where the confidence level is high, the signal to noise ratio is right, the angle of the aircraft is not too tilted, et cetera, so where the data, the analysis exceeds the confidence level. The point in case is that there is a very, very strong turbulence here, and that's the turbulence that poses the, the um, this is a log scale, this is a, uh, that poses the great danger to the aviation, and this shows the beauty of combining the in situ and remotely sensed data from the aircraft, avoiding to fly with the aircraft where it is the most dangerous. The 5th February observational summary, that is that, that comes from leg one here, I'm using leg one to illustrate it. In situ data, again, the updraft and downdraft at the flight level, in the right place, um, in the right phase, with what we see in the, in the uh, Wyoming cloud radar. The, there is turbulence there. I'm showing the uh, edit dissipation rate this time to illustrate really what it means for this aircraft. This, the orange, anything in orange and red is in the severe zone. So this actually was a severe jolt here at this point, but actually the extended region is down there underneath what is an exceedingly smooth flow in that, in that <coughs> wave. In order to understand what we are really dealing with here, what actually brought rise to, to these features at a very low level at the mountain crest and below, we used the mesonumerical model, mesoscale numerical model. Simulations were done with WARF. You see here the domain two, this is the inner domain of, of our simulation, and the, the, the prominent terrain features medicine bow, elk, sheep, the Laramie range, and the orientation of the flight tracks on the 26th of January, so it's line A, B associated with the 26th of January, and line C, B uh, for the 5th of February. Clearly now you see this line C, B crossing over three obstacles, and this one from the model output actually we will show, will show Laramie, Laramie range as well. The horizontal resolution of these simulations was 400 meter in the horizontal, so it does lie within terra incognita, uh, but uh, we checked and various uh, boundary layer parameterizations produced essentially the same result. And we do have uh, stretching in the, in the vertical with most grid points near the ground where it's of most interest and then stretching to up to the model top. Few uh, points of observation, comparison between verification of, of the model results, comparison with the observations. The upper panels you've already seen, Medicine Bow Mountain Wind Profiler on 26th of January and the 5th of February. Lower cross sections are the um, time evolution of the winds in the simulation at that same location. So again, to remind you for the 26th of January, this is the time of the sounding and on the, on the 5th of February. Um, the 26th January, it's actually from, from many aspects of the verification, the model simulation is in incredibly good. Um, on the 5th of February, we are dealing with some timing errors uh, regarding the passage of this short wave, and that does impact the, the quality of that simulation in terms of verifying the exact time and the exact location. However, when one takes that slight delay into account, um, um, we, we are quite satisfied with that solution, although it's worth exploring why this case has a lower predictability. So uh, this is the sounding that I've already showed you um, on the, the REM sounding, so the, the one in red. Um, and you see the comparison between the observations in red and the simulation in blue. Um, again, the model is slightly underpredicting this jet. Also, a larger discrepancy in the wind direction in what is essentially that portion of the sounding on the lee side where exciting things are happening. The flight leg comparison of the model data and the observations along the flight leg. Uh, red is the observational record. Uh, the, for the model, we took 15 minute snapshots within a three hour window centered on that time of the observation. Those are the blue lines. And you can see that they are fairly tightly packed. So there's little variability in the model solution 
And during the time window, most of the variation is in the horizontal wind, horizontal wind speed and some in the positioning exactly of that updraft. So there is some temporal evolution of the flow, simulated flow, but for the most part, it is, it is a very good comparison with the observations. I should also point there is an um, under, prediction, under prediction of that strongest wind. The cross-section AB, um, you see the flight level. Um, this is time in between leg three and leg five that I showed you previously. Strong downslope flow, you're looking at the component of the wind parallel to this cross-section. Strong downslope flow, something that looks like an angular hydraulic jump at low levels. A region of reverse flow near the ground. However, a reverse flow at or ab slightly above the flight flight level. A few other fields, the vertical velocity, downslope, very strong couplet, but also vertical velocity in this region below. This is the gradient of, of uh, potential temperature, so the measure of stability. We see the compression of that, packing of the isentropes on the lee side, following that angular feature, nothing much of the waviness here, strong downslope flow in the lee of the Laramie range, almost neutral stability in the lee of both ranges, and finally, subgrid scale turbulent kinetic energy, very strong TKE down here, um, and also non zero TKE up here in this region. So, all in all, what this looks like is a wave breaking, gravity wave breaking at, at the flight level slightly above of the large hydrostatic mountain wave that could propagate through, through this flow. And the, the upstream environment is just right to allow the propagation of, of a large hydrostatic mountain wave. On the lee side, underneath that wave breaking region, shooting down slow flow, recovery, and a very turbulent, what looks like an internal hydraulic jump and a turbulent region, a rotor underneath. So this would be an internal hydraulic jump type rotor. Medicine Bow Mountains is not exactly a two-dimensional mountain range. <laughs> and so to see what the degree of three-dimensionality there is here, I'm showing the vertical velocity and TKE at 3,000 meter above sea level. That plane slightly crosses. The, 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 you see the highest portion of the terrain here. The mountain range is there. Vertical velocity, perturbations in the lee of Elk Mountain, strong downslope flow, and then the, the couplet updraft, downdraft uh, there, and the momentum wake with momentum with a momentum deficit, strong turbulence in the lee, immediately, um, and the strong turbulence in that feature. So it looks like it, it's fairly two-dimensional. They are quite elongated. There is some flow channeling in between the medicine bow and elk. For the most part, um, we are so happy with, with the degree of two-dimensionality. Again, the wake is a 3D feature, so that, that, that's for sure. To illustrate some of the temporal evolution in this event, I'll show you a diagram that is for the four panels. They're all the same type. They show different fields. Um, distance from top of the Medicine Bow Mountain is on the x-axis. So you see actually where the mountain ranges are. So this is Medicine Bow. This is the Laramie Range. In this panel, which is a section parallel wind, um, you see strong winds on the lee side of both of these mountains. This is the pressure perturbation um, associated with the waves. So it's a pressure perturbation. This is vertical velocity at 3,000 meter and potential temperature at 3,000 meter. And the time in all four panels increases from bottom to top. And so that pulse of the momentum associated with short wave passage actually displays itself here at the low levels. The horizontal lines, I should say, delineate the time of, of the flight. So the feature that we observed and simulated also falls right here. And we see that retreat of the, of the uh, position of the leading edge of the boundary separation, um, which leading edge of that low level updraft, which you can actually follow here as the boundary between orange and light blue. You see that we see that retreat here um, in the velocity. We see it in pressure perturbation. We see it in vertical velocity. 
and to some degree also in potential, potential temperature. Another flow regime that, that is visible here much later after the flight is the regular wave field, what looks like regular waves in between the Medicine Bow and the Laramie range. And to illustrate you that flow, this is the flow at the time of the flight. We see features, gravity wave breaking, low level hydraulic jump. At 04 UTC the next day, um, there is a, indeed a train, regular train of waves in between Medicine Bow and the Laramie Range. There is a very strong down in the lee of both mountains and what looks like five wave crests in between these two mountain ranges, which based on our previous studies, both of these speak in favor of, of uh, positive resonance of waves, of train, of lee waves generated by these two mountain ranges. The temporal evolution for the February 5th in the same format. I will, uh, you will note that this, if you are searching for a retreat of the separation point, it lies here after the flight. So again, we, we do have some issue with the timing in this simulation, but still we see it in four, all four of these diagrams. We also see the pulse, stronger pulse of momentum before and after, but <laughs> not at the time of the flights. And we also see what looks like that Lee wave regime, the same Lee wave regime that I showed you that was much more clear in, in the previous case. Here, we are dealing again with three obstacles, and you can see their position. This is the Medicine Bow Mountain at zero. This is Elk Mountain. You can see a stripe of strong winds in the Lee of that mountain, and you can actually make out, find out the location, see the location clearly of Sheep Mountain with a very strong downslope flow there. So again, Medicine Bow, Elk, and Sheep Mountain. There are three mountains here. That flow morphology, um, this is fairly close. Again, if I take some delay into account, fairly close to what uh, the time of the observations, equivalent of the time of the observations, shows uh, ripples <laughs> at low levels, and shows indication of wave breaking uh, above the flight level. And at 03 UTC the next day, we see very short waves, a series of very short waves. They're still resolved, uh, no, no question about it. This is a resolved, numerically resolved motion. Uh, very short waves in, in, in the lee of these three obstacles. I should say in the lee of the um, Elk Mountain and Medicine Bow, not so much in the lee of Sheep Mountain. At different times, there is even less activity than is shown here. So in summary, um, I showed you lots of uh, model and, and data, and I thought the diagram is a very useful way of summarizing. So 26 January, we have two obstacles. The 5th February, we have three obstacles. You see those cross sections here. At or slightly before the flight times, those are the wind, this is the wind profile for the 26th of January and the 5th of February, and they're more or less, they, they have, bear the same characteristics. In the 26th January, uh, we have a large mountain wave that propagates upward, breaks because the flow is non-linear. We have gravity wave breaking in the lee of that other range, and we have a hydraulic jump at low levels and strong turbulence. In the 5th of February, uh, we have some gravity wave breaking. In this case, this is a breaking of, of non-hydrostatic waves. These waves are shorter. The obstacles, the, the, the spectrum, the terrain spectrum of this obstacle uh, promotes, together with the atmospheric structure, shorter waves, more non-hydrostatic waves. Nevertheless, they break, and the low-level flow responds um, in some wavy way uh, to induce a low-level rotor. At a later time, after the passage of this short wave, much, much later, a colder air mass sets in. Um, what It's stably stratified near the ground, but there is a neutral layer in both cases aloft. The wind profiles are different, or, or cross-section parallel winds are different. In the 26th January, the wind increases with height, 
These two things together promote wave energy trapping, and we see a very nice resonant Lee wave pattern there. These individual ones, wave crests, spawn rotors, each one of them um, has a rotor. In the other case, there is a stable layer underneath that neutral layer aloft. There's also a decreasing profile wind with height, and we see much shorter waves, and we see also uh, what looks like a resonance of these waves. So, I've said many of these things already. This represents the first direct observations of wave-induced boundary layer separation um, and this, in the case, the Wyoming cloud radar was used to, to document that. We observed non-stationary boundary layer separation, so there was that element. The question is why this boundary layer separation moves upstream, and to uh, this analysis has shown that this is associated with a change in the upstream conditions, um, with, with a change in the upstream environment. Um, that shift of the position is, is quite fast. Um, I mean, it's that strongest downslope low was 35 uh, meters per second. Um, this is much, much smaller. Nevertheless, it is significant. And it introduces the element of unpredictability where the most turbulence really will, will be located. Um, the obstacles surrounding the medicine bow were found to moderate this wave response. And at different times, we see different, different wave patterns. And my previous work um, has been focused on, on the resonance of Lee waves in between the two mountains. So we can carry that work on further in the domain, virtual, virtual domain of numerical simulations. Or we can resort to the laboratory experiments and this represents a bit of an outlook um, into what, what will come next. Uh, the experiments we already did were carried out in, the, in France in the CNRS, CNRM game uh, water flume in Toulouse. In, we did that in July to November 2000, this, uh, this past year. And the experiments were focused on Lee wave resonance, boundary layer separation, and rotors in flow past multiple, multiple obstacles. This is the facility. You see uh, a particular view. So the, the flu, water flume is down here. Um, you see uh, the um, towing tank. Uh, this, this element actually can be used as a towing tank, and this is how we used it. And this window provides view um, into, into the flow that is, it is down here. The setup that we used for these experiments was of a two obstacle. The Gaussian shape obstacles, mountain height, the separation between the obstacles can be varied. Um, and um, these experiments, the one that I will show you, the animation that I will show you uses the obstacles of the same height. Um, the uniform flow, so in both layers, there are two layers and the flow is uniform. The stability profile is not. There is a layer of neutral stability and a it's not quite a step in the, in the laboratory, but here in the diagram it is, to a layer of continuously stratified layer above, above that. Important in terms of the important parameters, the ratio of the mountain height in the, in the animation I will show you is 0.9. So the interface is quite close to, to the peak, mountain peaks. And the fruit number, this is a shallow water fruit number, ratio flow speed to the uh, speed of, of long gravity waves is 0.75. So that means that the flow actually can be, can go, uh, it's close to potentially to a transition into a supercritical flow. So it's subcritical with a potential transition to a supercritical flow. So here we will, I should actually bring this back to the beginning. So what you see is the flow is from left to right. This is the device uh, for, uh, for the um, 
particles. Uh, this is a release device for the particles. Uh, those are the passive tracers, uh, neutrally buoyant, um, and there is a stratification in them as well, so they're neutrally buoyant um, at different levels up here. Um, and you see the concentration of tracing particles down in the lower layer. This is the interface. This is a stable stratified phase law. So the, uh, the mountains are being pulled. They will be coming from right to left, which means that the flow over the mountains is from, from left to right. And here comes the first mountain into, into your view. And you can see the plunging flow on the lee side. And there is the first wave. There is the first wave. And you can persuade yourself that the flow is turbulent underneath, perhaps, if you squint your eyes. So there is that. Oops, I didn't want that. And then there is another one. So now you can see the second mountain as well. And the flow is adjusting so that there is a downslope portion of the wave aligning with the downslope, with the lee slope of the second mountain. And an excitement on the lee side of the second mountain with a train of these waves, quite strong amplitude waves, and quite a bit of flow is very turbulent uh, down there. So this is an example of a positive resonance of the lee wave trains generated by, by these two mountains. A much stronger response in the positive resonance, we find a much stronger response on the lee of that second mountain range uh, as compared to the first one. Okay, and I will stop there, go back, and show you a beautiful image from the T-Rex. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Vonda? So, obviously the model did very well here, but there was one thing that uh, when I compare with the T-Rex that surprised me, T-Rex, we had stronger winds, higher mountains, and we had, uh, I thought, maximum pressure perturbations of two and a half millibars, mm -hmm. and yet here we see nine millibars. That was what you showed on your curve with the, uh, the red in the pressure perturbations. Uh, so is that real, do you think? I think it is um, real, um, and this is a much stable, this is a much stable environment. This is January, February. Um, the stability is significantly higher than it is in that's what than it was in the T-Rex environment or is in the T-Rex environment in March and March and April. And it is the combination of these parameters. <laughs> it is not any single one of them, right? Um, and so it is. Yeah. yeah, it would be uh, nice if the, you had an airborne Doppler lidar. And then you wouldn't be dependent on just looking at the uh, responses where there's cloud particles. OK, let me see the next field campaign, right? <laughs> yeah. I think Chris has a question over there. Vonda, I wonder if you could uh, simply explain the the difference between flow configurations that lead to, uh, you, you mentioned separation and then rotors and hydraulic jumps. Uh -huh. And it wasn't, I wasn't clear when to expect a hydraulic jump from a separation versus a rotor. And could you maybe summarize when we should expect those two, those two phenomena to occur? And I, I, uh, this would be summarizing uh, the body of the T-Rex research or pre-T-Rex research. And yes, definitely, we, we do have a pretty good idea. So the, the conditions that would lead to a hydraulic jump, archetypal conditions, are with a very strong inversion near the mountain top and a clear layering structure in the atmosphere, a distinction, let's say, the stability um, or, or some other element of, of decoupling between the lower level and the, and the level above. That is likely to lead to a hydraulic jump, more likely to lead to a hydraulic jump rather than to lee waves. So especially if that separation line is close to, to the mountain top. That is more likely to lead to a stronger plunging and a hydraulic jump happening further down, downwind.
Um, I had a couple of questions on the clouds. So one of the um, things that some of the uh, wave cloud studies have shown has is that uh, in some of these uh, turbulent conditions, the snow can actually be entrained upward into the cloud from the surface. And uh, I was wondering if you might be able to comment on that. And the other part is uh, with the, the modeling, do any of the models uh, uh, that you're using uh, show whether the model got the clouds in the right location? Or is that simply not part of the uh, available data? Good, quite good questions. Uh, the much care went into into the analysis, radar analysis, and in, uh, in, in particular, we looking at what type of particles were encountered in, in those clouds. After all, the <laughs> campaign was focused on orographic clouds and the role of aerosols um, in, in forming those clouds. Um, most of the cloud particles were spherical sort of aggregates um, with a terminal velocity of approximately one meters per second. Now, when it comes very low to the ground, uh, whether this is um, snow swept by the down, uh, downslope windstorm into the cloud, um, we talked to, to glaciologists <laughs> to get their opinion of how likely something like that is to happen. And um, based on their advice, uh, we, we pretty much discounted, discounted that. Based on the, their research and, and, and their expert opinion, we discounted, uh, discounted that. Although um, it might be worthwhile to, to look further into that, to what degree. Um, if it's a packed snow, um, it's, it's, it's less likely to happen. It's a fresh snow um, that it could be a little bit lighter and could be, could be carried in. The second part of your question, whether we um, looked at the clouds themselves, whether they're in the right place, um, yes, we did, we did. And I, talk, I presented everything here as if it's dry dynamics, not boring, I hope, uh, but it, 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 the moisture doesn't play any role. Um, there is plenty of moisture, clearly. Um, it doesn't play much role, we checked in the, in the dynamics in terms of changing the stability, looking at the moist stability versus um, dry, Brunt-Weissala frequency. It doesn't change, doesn't affect that whole um, tremendous, doesn't affect it. The clouds are in the right place. Yes, the model predicts clouds and then they're, they're in the right place. Uh, so, Banda, the, uh, the evidence uh, you presented showed, uh, at least from the, the schematic diagrams, showed strong stability at low levels uh, topped by neutral stability above, uh, whereas the laboratory experiments seem to be the other way around. The so, laboratory. <laughs> what, what was the reasoning? Count, what was the reasoning? I can reasoning count for... on Rich and on catching <laughs> things like that. Uh, the laboratory experiments were actually motivated to to a certain degree more actually by the uh, T-Rex environment than it is by the Medicine Bow Mountains, but uh, it might actually turn out helpful in in helping us understand, especially when that difference is not overly large, that step in the stability. The, um, those who might, you might have noticed that on February 5th, actually, there is a layer, or maybe I have, I'm not sure whether that was in the slide, uh, there is a layer of neutral stability on the 5th of February, because the observations fall in midday, and actually there is a bit of a convective layer there on the 5th of February that develops. Uh, so it might actually be applicable to this. But the profiles themselves were more motivated by, by the T-Rex observations. Any further questions? If not, oh, one more. <laughs> Um, through a very slow process. <laughs> it takes, actually, they, they have a reservoir outside of the facility. It's a big tank, and uh, they mix, it's, it's brine, uh, so it's a mix of salt, salt and water. And they um, inject slowly water into that um, in order to achieve a continuously stratified profile. So it takes actually quite a bit of preparation in order to get a few laboratory runs. And if you thought that doing field work is slow, let me tell you, doing the laboratory work, <laughs> it's even slower for things, things like that. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Vanda one more time. Thank you very much.